In January, Oxford University Press announced its support for SHAPE, a new collective name for the humanities, arts, and social sciences, and an equivalent term to STEM. SHAPE stands for Social Sciences, Humanities, and the Arts for People and the Economy, and aims to underline the value that these disciplines bring to society. Over the last year or so, huge attention has rightly been placed on scientific and technological advancement. But does that mean we're overlooking the contribution of SHAPE in finding solutions to global issues? This is Julia Baker with the Oxford Comment. Social sciences, humanities, and the arts are a vital part of the fabric of the world around us, but we are seeing cuts to funding and drops in enrollment across many of the subject areas. On today's episode, we bring together a leading SHAPE researcher and a leading STEM researcher to discuss the ways in which we can strive for greater balance between the SHAPE and STEM disciplines. Our first guest is Dr. Catherine Murphy, a fellow in English literature at Ariel College at the University of Oxford. She is co-editor of On Essays and is currently editing several works for the forthcoming Oxford edition of Thomas Brown's writing. Speaking with Dr. Murphy is Professor Tom McLeish, the inaugural professor of natural philosophy in the Department of Physics at the University of York in the UK. He is the author of The Poetry and Music of Science and one of the editors of the scientific works of Robert Grosteste, Volume 1. Facilitating their discussion is Thomas Woolard, humanities correspondent for the Oxford Comment. Welcome to the Oxford Comet podcast. This is Thomas Willard, the Humanities Correspondent, and I'm joined today by Dr. Catherine Murphy and Professor Tom McLeish. So if you could quickly just describe your career and research for us, please. Uh, hello, I'm Catherine Murphy. Um, I studied Czech and English literature at the University of Glasgow and then came to Oxford for my master's and PhD in early modern literature. Um, and I write about the literature, philosophy and intellectual history of the 17th century, I'm particularly interested in the changes in knowledge in the period and the ways that those affect styles of writing. I'm now an associate professor in the English faculty at the University of Oxford, um, but I also teach various courses on science and literature in the 17th century. Um, I'm currently writing a couple of books which are relevant to this conversation about STEM and shape. Um, one is a short book about Robert Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, um, which is 400 years old this year, um, and which is an enormous compilation of ideas on mental disorder and unwellness, um, but written from the perspective not of a physician, but of a voracious reader. And the other book I'm writing at the moment is called The Tottering Universal, um, which is about the emergence of vernacular philosophical writing in English in the 17th century in the context of the beginnings of English empiricism and in experimental science. I'm... Um overwhelmed by that. I'm not quite sure why I'm interloping here. I'm Tom McLeish, uh, Professor of Natural uh, Philosophy, but I'm actually in the physics department. Um, I'm actually a soft matter physicist, so I uh, did a PhD at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge on, on polymers and plastics and the molecular theory underneath it. Um, uh, and I've also held lectureship posts at University of Sheffield, a, a chair at Leeds, where I ran a large group. Um, I was spent a few years, as my colleagues insist, on the dark side as Pro Vice Chancellor for research at Durham at University. Um, but everything I've ever done is interdisciplinary, and I've never really felt comfortable in the boundaries of a single discipline. The, so the physics I do, although from a humanities point of view, science can look over monolithic, um, I've always trespassed there too. So it was between physics, chemistry and chemical engineering last 10 years or so, I've been working as a physicist with biologists and finding uh, just how rich the different discourses, different methods, different ways of thinking about science work there. But uh, starting off in Durham, I started, uh, no, actually in, in Sheffield before then, started working with theologians. I've been fascinated by the history of theology and religion and science for a long time for lots of different reasons. And then from Durham, um, it was able to develop um, in a very satisfying way, a long-standing interest in the history of science, particularly the medieval history of science. So for 12 years now, I've been sort of a medievalist. And this job at York, I have a day a week officially in the Centre for Medieval Studies, uh, which is lovely. About half my time is devoted to working as a scientist in the humanities faculties um, and half in the science. I've kept core science going, which I think is very important actually run a national network on on physics and biology. But I've written a couple of books um, recently, and I suppose the one more 
relevant to our discussion is called uh, is with AUP. It's called the Poetry and Music of Science. Um, and I wanted to explore the role of creativity and imagination, which are different but linked within science. And I did that by comparing both the history and practice across sciences and arts and the humanities and found a very surprising story, which I was done like to tell. So that's an area I'm particularly interested in. And all all point to the early modern period. So that's where it all got wrong and fragmented. So I'm very interested to talk with Katie about that. Thank you very much for both of those introductions. So how would you say that to get into the meat of the topic, how would you say the opposition between arts and science has dominated modern discourse? And is it ever useful to think about the subjects in, in this kind of particular way? I don't care. Do you have an idea about where where it all started? I've, I've given you a start of a 10. Is, it, is it, it's the early <laughs> modern period that? Well, it's interesting because I think it would depend on who you asked. Um, and I was wondering if Tom, as a specialist in the medieval period, would have a different perspective on this from me. But for me, with my biases as someone who studies the Renaissance and the early modern period, I see a distinction clearly starting to emerge there. So some of the, the kind of people that I read and work on, like Francis Bacon or René Descartes, in the 17th century start to call for an increased attention to the stuff of the natural world. They start to complain about the scholarly culture of their time, which they see as too focused on reading, literary pursuits, verbal analysis, and the training of people in the production of texts, and instead demand a re-attention to the things themselves, as they put it, um, a new focus on empirical observation. Um, and Bacon calls this the advancement of learning, um, and for that he thinks it's necessary to reorient the attention that um, people are giving uh, to the works of the ancients towards investigating nature. And this is tremendously influential on in the generations that follow them. Uh, it leads, uh, Bacon's influence leads in England to the foundation of the Royal Society in 1660, um, and the promotion of the advancement of natural knowledge. Um, at the end of the 17th century, we get Isaac Newton, um, and there are ever increasing yields of discovery and knowledge in the natural world. And these two kind of domains of activity start to bifurcate. At the same time, I would also uh, point out that for Bacon um, and for many people in the 17th century, this is not about actually distinguishing two cultures. And I think that's a very modern idea. Um, and in some respects, and I wonder if Tom will share this view, um, quite a pernicious one <laughs> um, and a problematic one. So for Bacon, um, you know, all knowledge is one unity which has different branches. And this is a metaphor that he uses a lot. And he talks about the continuance and entireness of knowledge or the, the di distributions and partitions of knowledge, he says, are like branches of a tree that meet in a stem, interestingly, um, which hath a dimension and quality quantity of entireness and continuance. So for him, it's not about separating out two cultures. It's about a reorientation of attention um, to something that he thinks has been neglected and areas in which he thinks there could be advancement. Um, I think the history of the way that educational specialization has happened um, and also the history of the ways that universities have divided their faculties, divided um, the attention of both students and scholars has led to this more modern sense of two cultures, um, which is a phrase from uh, a 1959 lecture by, by C.P. Snow, um, very famously, I think. Um, Tom, does that chime with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think uh, we tend to understress the way that institutionalization, both sort of faculty framing, funding, educational pathways has, has, has um, contributed to to a, a, a polarization of, of uh, 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 disciplines, but you're quite right. I mean, one of the joys of of working with medieval um, authors is mm -hmm. that this is a different thought world. It's a world in which in which knowledge really is it's unified without being undistinguishable. I mean, just to take the educational structures of the uh, of the 12th and 13th centuries in in the early, you know, Oxford and Paris and universities getting going. There's the trivium and the quadrivium. So the trivium contains what we might begin to think of as the literary uh, sciences, and then the quadrivium, the more mathematical ones. But of course, music was a mathematical science, so was astronomy, so jump, jump, music. But reading authors like Robert Grosstes, which I spend a lot of time with my Durham and Oxford colleagues. Uh, working because Roger Bacon described Grosstes as the greatest mathematician, you see, of the 13th century. So he knew what a mathematician was, 
But Grosstas situates his his extremely mathematical uh, thinking around motion and matter and uh, all things material within a within a theological and literary tradition. Um, and of course, you know, we, it, it's it's exciting for a scientist today to be put in touch with the primary literature then, because mm -hmm. the myths, one of the reasons is that we're this whole narrative is burdened with with well, I'm tempted to call it conspiracy theory. I mean, completely wrong, wrong theory. I mean, the idea that the, you only have to pick up a medieval text on natural philosophy to know that the dis, apparent description that all these people were doing were recapitulating the ancients, you know, and, and bowing to scholarly authority is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, you know, the great creative minds were doing great creative things then. So that pins, if you like, that sort of brackets. So th th there's no two two cultures then. And you're quite right. In the early modern, you know, the 17th century itself, um, you know, I've recently got very interested in 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 science and poetry uh, because actually version one of, of of the book I got wrong. I I I said that one aspect of the two cultures is that Wordsworth's great hope he wrote in in the preface to Lyrical Ballad, second edition, is that is that the day would come when science would inspire poetry as much as any other. Um, activity or experience of, of, of human beings. And I said, of course, that's not been, that's not true. Um, uh, but, but of course it actually has, and it was true. So the 17th century saw people like Elizabeth Tollett, who, 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 who uh, knew Newton very well, um, John Donne, the, you know, uh, um, Milton. I mean, there was, there was um, rich intercourse mm -hmm. between science and poetry. In fact, the scholar I've had a bit of correspondence with, Ernst Huber in Munich. I'd love you to tell me, Catherine, what you think about what she says, so Erntrad says she reckons that the the seeds of separation, if you like, planted in the early modern century, really came to fruition in early Romanticism in poetry first, and it was poetry that that that, that divided. But so I, I mean, two brief quotes, to, one sentence quotes to, to illustrate that. One is so going back to Thomas Spratt. I feel very guilty, actually, the Royal Society, it's all the Royal Society's fault, of course, it always is. Um, he wrote this weird book we called The History of the Royal Society in, in uh, 1667 or 8, so only about five or six years in, so it wasn't a history, it was like a manifesto. And he talked about scientific writing and sort of thinking. It said, he says, we must separate the knowledge of nature from the colours of rhetoric, the devices of fancy, or the delightful, delightful deceits of fables. And I think that's so that's embedded in that book. That illustrates how the early institutionalization, the professionalism of science, also started to drive the wedge. So by the time we get to um, mid 19th century, it's 1848, year of revolution, perhaps. But but we get um, actually a, a progenitor of my my own book, Michael Robert Hunt, wrote a book called The Poetry of Science. But Hunt's poetry of science isn't about a comparison of creativity or if you like, uh, uh, humanities sort of shape like in, create within science. Uh, it's all about people going, wow, at science. And he says this, he says, the fumes of the laboratory, it's alkalics and acids, the mechanical appliances, the observatory, it's specular and lenses do not appear fitted for a place in the painted bowers of the muses. So in, in typical romantic prose, that by that, that, here we have the two cultures. It's fascinating. The whole the whole um, question of the relationship between rhetoric and um, what what we anachronistically in the 17th century call science, because they talk about natural philosophy or natural history. Philosophy and history, of course, are what we now think of as arts disciplines. And the, again, it's a sign of the the indistinction um, between the methods of these uh, different focuses of attention um, that they're still called philosophy and history. Um, but that question of the the rhetoric of scientific writing, I mean, Spratt, as you say, does reject the colours of rhetoric, or at least seems to, while surreptitiously deploying them himself. Oh, and, Robert, <laughs> and Robert Boyle um, talks in an essay about why he uses essays as the genre for science. He says, you know, we shouldn't use um, elaborate rhetoric when we're writing about scientific uh, material, because that would be like to paint the lenses of your telescope. That, but he then goes on to say, however, you wouldn't want to bore your reader 
So it's important that your writing nonetheless be persuasive and elegant. And after all, we do decorate our telescopes, just not the lenses of the telescopes. So he has a, a kind of distinction between the rhetorical delivery of science and the, the actual instrumental observation that happens through the lens. Well, but the, yeah, obviously, Boyle is fascinating and he yeah. calls on metaphor in um, a wonderful ways. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but the question of poetry and science, a very important development in the Renaissance and in the 16th and 17th centuries, is the rediscovery of Lucretius's ancient poem, De Rerum Natura, which is the on, um, on the nature of things and is a uh, uh, an epic hexameter poem on physics. It's about the nature of the natural world. It's about the constitution of the cosmos. Um, and it's, a, it's an immensely significant thing for, um, for the early modern period, the rediscovery of this poem. Um, and that gives a model for writers um, in the six, a, a dangerous model because he's considered atheistical and libertine and dangerous. But it gives a model of the ways in which poetry can seriously engage, not just in the delivery of um, scientific work, but also in thinking through its mechanisms. So in Lucretius, there's a fundamental analogy between the letters with which a poem is made up and the uh, elementa, he calls it, the, the atoms with which the world is constituted. And that influences everybody. Robert Boyle, again, talks about um, when he's trying to argue for the madeness of the world, um, talks about the world as being constituted like the Aeneid, um, a complicated poem with its own kind of syntax and the human body as having a, a syntax and a grammar that means that we have to read it as if it is a, an artistic production. Um, and I'm, the metaphor I'm, runs throughout the period. Yeah, I'm, I'm just fascinated by this. Oh, and um, I should say that it, my experience of, 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 of researching and writing poetry, music and science, the book I thought I was going to write just wouldn't allow it to be written, the cells to be written. I thought I was going to write, OK, here's my conversations with artists and poets and musicians and so forth and, I, and their creativity. And here's my you know, similar but rather different conversation with scientists. And, and here's a lovely undergraduate essay as a final chapter bridging between the two. Can't write that book. It's impossible to write that because because it's not true. Um, in fact, that the, the, there isn't a humanities or arts mode of of creative thinking the new. There are different modes, and I, I found that people some people think visually, and some people think textually, and some people think in abstract ways. But those three, I, those arbitrary, but they they work for me. They they cross all all domains, and the wordy one halfway through the project still at Durham. I remember Pat War, uh, professor of English at Durham. You might, you might know Pat Virginia Wolf Scarls. So very interested in, in science. She said to me, Tom, you know, you know, don't you, that it's not a coincidence that the early English novel and the experimental method have their origin in the same century. It's, it's that back mm -hmm. half of the 17th, early 18th century. What are you talking about? But, you know, and then sure enough, you have Joseph Priestley a century later saying, you know, well, um, uh, works of fiction, they really resemble globes and orreries and experimental apparatus. Yeah, and and then and then you and then you start to realise there's something uh, there's something re really to be said here about about the the confidence that both the scientific experiment and writing a whole new a whole little micro world that one has to do with a novel and watching it the fact that every novel writer who's ever reflected or written down reflections on their process talks about observation in explicit terms as, as what they do with their characters and the, even in science you see we, we now think of it obvious you should do experiments but it never was obvious because because it, and Margaret Cavendish as an early early modern philosopher is the best at putting a finger on this why should something as artificial as simplistic and as disconnected as a little experiment tell you anything about the real world it, it, and it took a theological imagination of, of Bacon, uh, Francis Bacon, to sort of leap over that. But it's the same sort of, of confident imagination that allows uh, um, Daniel Defoe to create an island and create a man and a situation and to see what happens when uh, when these two meet on the island. So I think there is there is something about the early modern human picking up of creativity and small world creativity that 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 brings these two literary world, worlds together. Thank you very much for explaining about the kind of dichotomy that has kind of come about between um, STEM and shape subjects. Could you 
give us your views on the growth of interdisciplinary research between the two. Well, I think we've been talking about that. I mean, so actually already. So uh, what I would say is that the way that the way that interdisciplinary research is between the humanities and sciences and the social sciences is being sold, as it were, or narrated in, in the public sphere at the moment. Nothing wrong with this, but it tends to come from challenges, you know, the global challenges. The, the rhetoric is uh, there isn't a serious big global problem that can be solved within a single discipline. Well, that's absolutely true. I mean, there, there is, that's, that's true. Um, you, we, we do need to work to work together. But I think the sort of things that Kate and I have already been, been talking about illustrate that the further one digs down into the innovative generative cause of our disciplines, the more we need to feed off each other uh, in just in the, in, in the realm of, 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 of academic thought itself. I don't know if you'd agree. Yeah, um, I'm currently involved in a project. Um, it's a curation project with a with a with a group from the Department of Psychiatry in Oxford, where we are um, curating an exhibition, uh, which simultaneously commemorates the 400th anniversary of the Anatomy of Melancholy, which I mentioned earlier, of work by uh, Robert Burton, um, and thinks about contemporary treatments for uh, for melancholy, low mood depression. And that has been a really interesting uh, piece of collaborative work because of because of what it's possible for us to learn from one another um, and because of the, the ways in which it casts um, new light on things that we are thinking about anyway. I mean, I think what I think one of the possibilities of interdisciplinary research, um, I think specialization is actually a good thing. Specialization drives new knowledge. Specialization um, and working with your peers at the very edges of understanding of, of whichever field it is that you work in. That's a really important thing. Um, but then communicating that to other people <laughs> who are not working in your field so that they can both see the value of what is being done and can also see its applications or its analogies or its creative potential for, for what you're doing is really important. And I think there's a kind of, um, a kind of uh, movement between those two kind of um, domains of yeah. particularity and then uh, communication of that to others that's really important. Yeah. Um, I, completely, I completely agree. The way I, uh, the way I, I like to put it is that um, uh, interdisciplinary thinkers and workers need to be uh, T-shaped people. Uh, so <laughs> by that I mean, you know, not uh, yet you have to have your vertical deep, deep drilling down into your discipline because you simply need to bring something to the party. And if we are all Jackson Jills of all of all trades, then 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 th we won't have, have anything much, much to bring. But equally important is the horizontal valency. You've got to have you have your the T across the top, which is your hand holding with other other disciplines, because as you've just described, you know, uh, uh, Katie, great interdisciplinary work comes from teams, not individuals. I and mean, that's even true of, of science itself. That it should be lauded more. My own example, which resonates so much with yours, the Ordered Universe project, um, uh, which is around scientists and humanities scholars working on medieval science. You know, we hoped that in the early days of the project, we hoped that those of us with a scientific or mathematical Apple form, uh, formation would be able to help some of these poor, you know, humanities scholars who are struggling with the maths behind the Latin. And yeah, uh, good job they could read the Latin too. I mean, and that turned out to be true when we were able to solve some interesting problems. But the last thing we expected was our great delight, because there hasn't been, we've read about 10 of these now, um, there isn't a single 13th century scientific treatise we haven't read together. We read them together line by line. At, during which one of the scientists hasn't said, hmm, that's a really interesting question. I did. did anyone ever follow that up? I don't think they did. So we've actually had about 10 science papers inspired by reading medieval natural philosophy. And uh, so I think there are other people like Hassock Chain, Cambridge, who are doing this in other ways. So uh, uh, part of the exemplar of how fields can work together in this generation of deep innovation is that ideas can hop between one and the other. And the history of science is, just to take one example, a huge um, uh, harvest field of, of unsolved problems for science today. I completely agree with what Tom just said. Um, one of the things that I think is really um, important about um, what humanities and shape subjects uh, contribute is a kind of 
ability to think about how things were, how things are, and how things could be. Mm -hmm. um, and in working with uh, people from the Department of Psychiatry and thinking about um, the differences between and similarities with uh, how mental health was conceived in the early modern period and how it's conceived now, um, the the contrast precisely what Tom was just describing of that kind of simultaneous recognition and surprise um, when confronted with the history of your own discipline or confronted with examples um, from history which enables you to think about how things might be differently configured it makes you helps you to see the problems from different angles and it has been both you know, very entertaining for them, I think, to think about um, ways in which early modern people thought about delusion or melancholy, but also stimulating to thinking about holistic ways right. of conceiving of mind and body, um, ways of thinking about the, the, the paradigms, ways that things have changed um, for their discipline, so that kind of pharmaceutical obsession um, is fading in some senses to, towards a more holistic view of, um, of how cures for mental ill health might happen. And I think thinking about the history of your discipline, for example, can really help with that and can really stimulate with that. It's one of the, the gifts of shaped subjects to um, imagine difference whether that be through fiction or whether it's through history and the exposure of how things have been done otherwise, whether it's through the speculative work of philosophers, okay. um, that imagining things otherwise um, is something that I think uh, shape subjects do particularly well, but it's also something that um, STEM subjects do because of course, in order to project your uh, next um, developing idea, you have to imagine how things could be otherwise. Yeah, one doesn't deduce uh, our model of the universe, one induces it, so it has to imagine it. And the penny dropped for me once when I realised that what my colleagues meant, actually very few scientists talk about the scientific method, to be honest. And, and you know, look, I've often said, look, if there was such a thing as a scientific method, I'm a professor of physics, right, before I was, uh, I would have had a course in it, wouldn't I, at some point? Wouldn't <laughs> I? Well, no, I haven't. And, the, and, and so, uh, yeah, but, but in any case, insofar as there is a method, there is a sort of general framework rather than a method for how one, you know, t tests and checks and proves one's hypothesis, you know, when you've got them, when you've got them. But, but how on earth is one supposed to form these hypotheses? What, as you, as you say, Kate, how the world might be, how might the world be so that my telescope detects this thing? How might the world be such that this virus does this? Um, and that's that's the power of imagination. So science needs this, but we don't talk about it very much. And I completely agree that one of the ways in which we can learn together is to compare our notes and work practices and life practices on what we do um, to get great ideas. <laughs> and and, and, and I just having worked in interdisciplinarity of different distances in the past, you know, physics and chemistry, physics and biology, physics and medieval studies, whoa, I have the impression that the further you go, I mean, there is a sort of vague distance measure in, 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 in academia now, you know, it's measured by, you know, you can be in the department in the same faculty, you can be in different faculties, but just there's a sense in which if you can put the energy in to communicating to a distant discipline, the further you go, the higher is the potential of the electric spark of ideation that might just jump between you. Yeah, I think that's partly to do with the vanity of small differences, isn't it? Where, you know, you're you're much more likely to see the gulf between you and your sibling in a different period in the same uh, department than you are uh, between yourself and somebody in an entirely different zone. Um, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear you say a little bit more about, you've worked on this thing w w called the anxiety of variety, um, which is, a, I don't know who could, as you tell us about where that phrase comes, it's an early modern phrase, I understand, but I mean, I, I think we perhaps call it knowledge overload the, these days, but. Yeah, um, it, it's not an early modern phrase, I, I coined the phrase. Oh, you coined it, I beg your pardon, oh, it's you a, coined it so beautifully, I wish it were Thomas Piano. It, it's, it's a phrase that I've used to describe the kind of motivating um, instincts behind lots of projects in the 17th century, so a sense that the world is too various, too manifold, 
too full of data, too full of different people um, and cultures for us to come up with some kind of unified truth. So there's a reason my book's called The Tottering Universal, which is also based on that, that worry that supposedly universal knowledge could be collapsed at any moment because some egregious exception could be discovered. Um, it's partly the kind of thing that a writer like Michel de Montaigne talks about when he's writing his essays where he says there is no quality so universal as variety and diversity and this poses a challenge to the possibility of universal knowledge so everybody is so particular and idiosyncratic the natural world is so various the discovery of america has yielded um you know so many more uh examples of animals and peoples and languages which are just manifold uh, examples of how complicated the world can be um, you know the discoveries to, of Copernicus and Kepler are challenging the sense of the centrality of uh, the earth to the universe um, the microscope not quite invented at the beginning of the 17th century but um, about to come is going to you know make the smallness of the world ever more tiny. The printing press is prol proliferating printed material. It's information overload um, on a grand scale. And so the anxiety of variety goes along in the period, I think, with pleasures of variety. So mm -hmm. the wonder of observing natural history or thinking about um, the curious variety of customs of peoples all across the world um, as a kind of motivating factor to epistemological projects like Francis Bacon's. So he wants to return to the things themselves in order to abstract into a knowledge that is better and truer on a true basis. Or Montaigne or Burton want to console you for the anxiety of variety with the pleasure that you can take in curiosity in various ways. But it's been a really useful concept to me because it also speaks to our contemporary moment, um, <laughs> because we too have our forms of information overload for different but cognate reasons. You know, we too have technological transformations, which mean that we are bombarded with data that we don't fully know how to assimilate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <laughs> And it's also useful because it helps me to think about um, the one big governing problem, which is both the subject of the kind of work that I do and sometimes uh, one of the obstacles to getting any of it finished, which is the many and the one. Um, you know, the kind of the sense that there are so many different things and they are all interesting, um, but focusing on one thing might enable <laughs> might enable a clearer focus um, and, a, and a more coherent um, range of activities. So um, and it relates directly to the question of interdisciplinarity, because yeah. You know, yeah. there's the there's the temptation of the many, the attractions of the many, the worry that one might spread oneself too thin, that it's impossible to compass all the disciplines in uh, in in the academy in the world that knowledge is too much for any one person and people often talk about the renaissance as the last period in which um, you could have someone like a bacon or a leonardo da vinci or a figure who could you know straddle disciplines and really encompass um, the whole world of knowledge in a way that after this period becomes impossible because of advancement and specialization yeah, I think that's true of figures, but my hope is that it, it could still be true of, of communities. Um, and and be, because it's possible to achieve various degrees of fine grainedness or coarse grainedness of, of knowledge. So the way I work in, in with my colleagues at York now is in my human, I will co-supervise humanities masters and, and PhDs, but I will not supervise them. I'm not a humanities scholar in their discipline. But I now, you know, after 20 years of working with societies with humanities scholars, feel that I probably can contribute when their subject has some scientific or astronomical or whatever uh, requirement. And, and that um, because I have a sort of coarse grained understanding of their discipline with a few tiny fine grained spots, you know, which would never allow me to pass muster. But that's what I need and the language to work to work with them. And that's not I'm not claiming to be, of course, Leonardo da Vinci, but of course not. But I think, but it's it's within those communities. I think it works. And you've, I wonder if you've just made me think of Pascal's, um, you know, ces espaces immenses m'effraient. And I wonder whether I've always just thought of him just just uh, um, 
uh, sort of revolting at the sheer concept of hugeness of the universe. But I wonder, being Pascal, whether he's actually talking about the anxiety variety of of of, mm -hmm. of, of the immense detail that he that he sees. Pascal, Pascal is a great reader of Montaigne, so that inherited um, sense, which in Montaigne reads as a kind of scepticism. Um, about the the world's variousness and its uncompassability by uh, by our systems of knowledge and the various ways in which um, uh, kinds of knowledges and sciences abstract from the particularity and the idiosyncrasy of the surface of things in order to focus their attention. Um, yeah. I think I think those are things yeah. that they pair. But and, and like all t sorry, I would say like all tensions. Mm -hmm. um, the tension between universality and particularity is a really creative one. Um, mm -hmm. Happens in poetry, but I mean physics. I feel very fortunate to be in in my own science because physics sits right at the um, the sort of nexus of of as far as we are aware, extremely universal. We call them laws. Um, so just a metaphor, but you know, uh, gravity, for example, seems to be the, the, the work the same across all the universe, all, all all times. But the variety of the consequence of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Just take one example of of the the exploration of our solar system in the last twenty years has led to there are about twenty or thirty spherical, rocky bodies of the size of our moon, little worlds. And every single one is different. Jupiter's got one that looks like a pizza. It's cooking as Io. There's Enceladus with an ice world with an underground ocean. Mercury is Janus' face. I could go on and on. It's delicious, but they all just form of rocks under gravity. Yeah, and I think I mean I think that's an example as well. You mentioned the word attention um, uh, just a minute ago, and I think thinking about the disciplines as different ways of schooling attention, or different ways of focusing attention, or or different disciplines of attention, I think is quite a useful way to think, certainly about the humanities, um, and also and also about the the way that the uh, STEM subjects work. Um, but the one of the things that I think the humanities do, in addition to acts of, of particular attention, which um, you know in themselves confer value, whether that be attention given to a culture, a piece of art, um, a piece of literature, um, but is also to think both kind of critically and creatively about the about the giving of attention and what values it is that we're conferring when we attend to particular things and to think about the things that we neglect and what things are invisible in in, in our attentiveness so would you say that um I'm really, would you say that the humanities might might particularly be able to gift the sciences in this ability of thinking at different scales of framing and context um, so I think the science is better if it's contextualized or at least it's, uh, uh, even if a particular problem is thought of as it were from different distances as as one would a picture one you know it looks at an impressive impressionist piece of art by 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 going right up to the canvas with your nose and seeing the incredible brushwork but you can only understand how it all works by 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 stepping stepping right back and and I wonder if that's a a, a, a way that the humanities might be able to help um shape might be able to help stem in future yeah and I think I think um, conversations in general, you know, the 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 difference of perspective and the widening of perspective that comes from, you know, widening access to our various disciplines uh, in all kinds of senses, whether that's at the level of um, of of admission to university, attracting applications from people to university, you know, multiplicity of perspective is not just a kind of global. Um, good because it means that things are multifarious and you know there's a kind of ecology of variety which is which is useful but it's also individually useful one's own perspective is enriched um, by conversations with um, other disciplines with uh, people working in different fields um, and with thinking about the ways in which those kinds of learning um, or kinds of of the, the silo in which one might use, be used to thinking um, can be set in a relativizing context by thinking about it historically or by thinking about it in its neighborliness with other disciplines. Um, and I think that's something we've both experienced in, in our work and in conversations um, with people in different fields. So talking about the perception of shape, um, what do you think the kind of different skill sets are that shape and STEM kind of need 
and we've heard that several times that students are kind of favouring STEM subjects over shape. So what should scholars do in both subject fields to, to try and counter this? I think in some ways we can overemphasize the similarity of the skill sets within shape and STEM <laughs> because yeah. my own distinction as someone who is primarily an interpreter of texts and ideas and a writer and speaker about them are very different to the statistical analyses of data that a linguist might produce or um, you know someone who a social scientist engaged in the study of populations or a geographer who's thinking about migration um, you know those are all broadly conceived under the shape banner but they're very different disciplines um, as they're constituted at the moment stem and shape name more objects of attention than they do practices of attention, I think, um, because um, the STEM subjects are largely directed as they're currently conceived towards technology and nature um, or the natural world and shape is largely directed towards um, people and societies mm. and the productions of human beings um, as their objects of attention. And within that, there's a lot of variety in the ways that, that people um, uh, practice their disciplines. And I'm sure the same is true of STEM. I'm sure that microbiologists are doing something radically different to a theoretical physicist to oh, you know, my. engineer with. <laughs> Which one of the heart, uh, half of it? I mean, I found it, it, when I started working with biology, actually, I didn't do any biology, not a GCSE was O level then. I never did any biology, mainly because I, I've always had a really bad memory. And biology, you have to really be able to just remember lots and lots of facts. And I could never do that. And the great thing about physics, at least in its early stages, is you could so you know you only have to know about three things you can work the rest out but uh, um but so there is this deep contrast of focus to immense variety and particularity um and the distinct is which by you know so so i've learned so much about what attention to detail in science can deliver from my biologist colleagues and i hope if they've learned anything from me it might have been well you know every so often it's worth stepping back and asking well is the answer to this question and understanding really at the level of the particular atoms and molecules attached to this particular point or is it at a larger a larger <laughs> scale might it be something to do with disorder rather than order and so some of these counter factual um might it be this way actually uh, but uh, george mcdonald i came across a lovely um uh, piece in George MacDonald's uh, Dish of Orts. He's not very well read, not much read these days, but of course George MacDonald, the great uh, inventor of fantasy uh, literature, was fascinated by science and loved thinking about science. And uh, he imagines a conversation that he might have had with Thomas Spratt, who we met earlier on. And Spratt comes and says, ah, oh, it's all about empiricism. You can't learn about the world apart from doing experiments. And MacDonald says, ah, but how did you dream up the experiments to do? And you'll find your heart is involved there too. Um, so you know, I, I know we're not quite saying, quite asking Thomas's question question here because I, I agree it's um, that that the differences in our disciplines are termed the collective discipline. I mean, I, to stick again, the histo what a historian does in marshalling evidence and asking which pieces of factual evidence weighted by their certainty might lead to certain underlying hypotheses of events one can't directly observe. We do that in science all the time. Um, but it's, so it is much more the object. But then if it's the object, why is it that inanimate objects of nature have, have attracted the preponderance of one set of disciplines and human discourse and ideas and narrative the other. Um, I mean, I know we get a bit frightened when we think about scientific analysis of, 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 of humanity and Zola, you don't have to go too far back though to find a novelist like Zola who, who says the novel is going to be the, the primary experimental tool in a new science of communities. Well, perhaps we should think, perhaps we should go more cross-modal. I think in some ways, um, if you think about uh, what it would look like or what it does in fact look like in our um, in, in our contemporary world where people are thinking about similar problems in the world, but from their different perspectives. So, you know, um, it will not have escaped anybody's notice that we have just gone through and are still going through um, uh, globally um, a pandemic in which the, the attention of scientists has been, of course, 
um, very uh, publicly focused on um, on vaccines, on communicating data about epidemiology. Um, at the same time, though, there has been a huge focus on what flourishing consists in, what wellness consists in, in a situation where a population is is put in a condition of lockdown, um, and that has had scientific and medical and uh, arts-based solutions, arts-based um, questions are being asked. I know in the university there are lots of research projects which collaborate between, say, the museums and um, the Department of Psychiatry, thinking about um, how people's uh, you know, mental health, how their health are affected um, in these circumstances in relation to art. Studies of how much people are reading. I know there's a, a uh, work at the University of Portsmouth on this at the moment, um, on how literature has been uh, an important part of people's experience recently. And I think faced with particular problems, you can see the ways in which the um, different disciplines have different things to bring to what adds up to an overall focus on human flourishing or innovation or whatever kind of bettering of uh, the state of things might be desired. And a similar issue is, is thinking about climate and environment. Um, thinking, I was, I was uh, prompted to think about this, Tom, by by you talking about the kind of narrow focus of um, the individual scientist or biologist, or thinking about um, you know these planets. You know the the ways in which we attend to nature um, is a huge theme at the moment for literary study um, and also for for historical studies of how people have dealt with situations of, of change, of weather, of climate, of death in the past. So the ways in which our various disciplines respond differently to emerging challenges, um, I think both speaks to differences between the disciplines, but also to the ways in which both have things to offer, um, both STEM and shape subjects have things to offer in these contexts. So before we conclude for the for the day, we've heard several times about needing to achieve a balance between STEM and shape subjects in academia. So where would you say that that balance lies and do we need to achieve a more balanced future for it? I'd love to hear uh, what Catherine might say about the possibility of uh, of degree courses that are entirely integrated. I mean, there's one at UCL, but I wonder whether at the future there would be, I hate to use the word market, but you know, students would be really interested in university degree formations that, that bring equally the humanities and the sciences together in an integrated way. Well, as somebody who grew up in Scotland and is therefore a product of the Scottish school and university system, um, I do find the English university system specialises extraordinarily early and the, and the school system. Um, so, I mean, this is a question which I think extends between school and university in terms of the, the diversity of things that people can do at early stages. Um, there are already joint degrees in science and humanities subjects, um, but they're very particular in my institution, you know, maths and philosophy, physics and philosophy, um, computer science and philosophy, where, you know, people are working, where, where, where the disciplines are already cognate um, and where the aim is not to offer people um, a kind of, in, in the American style, a broad grounding at undergraduate level with a kind of major and minor where there's a requirement to do courses from different uh, uh, areas of knowledge, um, but more because they're they're already sibling. Um, and personally, I think both in terms of uh, I, I think in terms of even internally within shape, uh, a diversification of of what it would be possible for people to do as their first degree at university would be really rich. And mm -hmm. the idea of extending that to have a sense um, to go back to Bacon's um, Bacon's phrase, the continuance and entireness of knowledge, to have a sense that one is initiating oneself into the entireness of knowledge and specialising from a broader base would be would be extremely attractive um, to me personally. <laughs> I hope so. And I think it would apply, would 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 supply a next generation of students with a much richer skill set, just to talk about that a very instrumental level than 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 I certainly had. I have a Scottish surname, but I didn't come through the Scottish system, unfortunately, which I had. 
Um, but I, I also wonder whether the day will come when we'd recognise uh, that science is actually a humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think it would do as, uh, 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 it'd be very interested to ask the question why for th not just centuries but millennia has it been an essential part of being human to reflect on what underlie what order underlies the natural world and how might we understand it and as Einstein said this you know the most incomprehensible thing about the world is it's comprehensible the sheer surprise that we can do science I've always felt has has huge humanities consequences, just that experience. And it, you know, among that huge theological consequences, by the way, for my theologian friends. So, so the real theological question around science is not, you know, how do you make compatible science and, and, and religious belief? That's a dull, fruitless question. But but the much more interesting, interesting question of what is like, like all theological questions, what is at the heart of purpose of, 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 of human beings and why do we do this? It all goes back to something you were saying much earlier about the trivium and quadrivium of the medieval and early modern university. Um, those those seven subjects are called the liberal arts and uh, astronomy and mathematics are included in the arts curriculum yes. in the earlier conception of the university. Yes. Um, I didn't expect to end this conversation by advocating a return to the early modern university, but I suppose with my... We could try. <laughs> well, we could offer a, 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 a liberal arts, a proper liberal arts, as in the trivium and quadrivium to another generation of students. Let's let's do, let's, let's work on that. Let's do a your Oxford thing and see see how I'm, it works. I'm out. not sure. I'm not sure it would make Francis Bacon happy, but that's not why we're here. <laughs> that's not definitely not why we're here. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Catherine Murphy and Professor Tom McLeish for joining us today, and thank you very much for joining us on the Oxford Comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We want to thank Dr. Catherine Murphy and Professor Tom McLeish for joining us for today's spirited and informative discussion. Please check out our show notes on the OUP blog for further reading on SHAPE, along with a suggested reading list that provides even more context for understanding how the SHAPE and STEM disciplines interact with one another. New episodes of the Oxford Comment will premiere on the last Tuesday of each month. Be sure to follow OUP Academic on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, and YouTube to stay up to date on upcoming podcast episodes. While you're at it, please do subscribe to the Oxford Comment wherever you regularly listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or Stitcher. Lastly, we want to thank the crew of the Oxford Comment for their assistance on today's episode. Episode 61 was produced by Stephen Philippi, Ella Percival, and Bethany Drew. This is Julia Baker. Thank you for listening.